I first got the trip idea in my head when I was coming up upon graduating from college and my mom was very encouraging saying that I should travel somewhere and so she asked me where I wanted to travel and I thought about it you know there's limits financially time wise and everything else but if I thought about anywhere in the world I figured the US was a really big place I hadn't seen a lot of it so that was a good place to start and I really wanted to check out the Pacific Northwest. My mom pitched the idea of maybe biking there. I had an uncle that biked across the country and the more I thought about it, I figured I would be fine physically. Financially, biking is a pretty cheap way to go and I was fortunate enough to have a whole lot of time on my hands. I kind of set on the idea that I'll bike out to Oregon and Washington and check out those areas. And then I thought about the U.S. a little bit more, and there's a lot of places in the Northeast that I hadn't seen. So why not go ahead and just bike up to the Northeast? We're heading out to Washington and Oregon. And then I have a huge family with a lot of relatives, friends, and everything else in Northern California, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Diego. So I figured I'll just go ahead and bike down the coast all the way to San Diego. And as I planned out that trip, that was a good eight and a half thousand miles or so. And it would have only been, that would have been two thirds of the trip. It would have only been another 4,000 to go across back to Florida and back up. So in for a dime, in for a dollar, I figured might as well just bike back home at that point. <laughs> My cousin Murdoch got the idea to bike across the country. And he started a year ago with his girlfriend. The plan for Caitlin was for her to bike from Virginia to California and fly back to start her new job. My uncle that took a bike trip is a hard one to get a hold of, so unfortunately I wasn't able to sit him down and you know, talk to him about the bike trip, but I had heard stories from all of his siblings, my aunts and uncles and my mom. And there's another influential person that had biked across the country in my life and that was my friend's father um, Don Heinemann and he lived right down the road and so one afternoon we figured we'd go over spend all afternoon making dinner and then the evening eating dinner and discussing this bike trip and so he was a he was a great help a great resource to have in figuring out what to bring how to bring it what to pack, what you won't need, all sorts of stuff like that. My aunt brought the idea to me last summer when she decided I could ride a girlfriend's bike back when she went halfway. This idea never really came to me that I could do it until my aunt brought it up to me and then I just thought I don't have a better time to do it. I don't have a I haven't started a career yet or a family and I've got lots of time, a little bit of money and I really want to see the country so it's a great way to see the country at a low cost. The idea started I think with my mother and Murdoch talking back and forth about it um, but for me to join in I kind of just was coming towards graduation at James Madison University. Didn't really know what I was going to get into after graduation. Saw Murdoch would roughly be around, you know, California. So I decided what a perfect opportunity of time to just fly out there, join them, and, you know, extend or prolong that period of time where I have to get a job or at least think about it. Caitlin and Ben rode the same bike, and then Jackson and I purchased a different but similar bike. For the bike on the trip, I purchased a bike that was made for long distance touring. It was a little bit sturdier. It didn't have shocks like a mountain bike, but it wasn't lightweight, so it was designed to go long distances and carry the loads that I projected I would have. I bought that eight or nine months before the trip and just rode it around everywhere. 
for the trip, I ended up purchasing a uh, Surly Disc Trucker, which was a, a, a very nice bike, one I actually saved up my entire life for. Um, it ended up being a pretty nice bike and held up very well. I did not get a special bike for the trip. I just used the one that Caitlin had ridden across the country with and just swapped out with her since I was approximately the same size. To train, I would just use my bike to ride anywhere and everywhere I needed to be. When I was down at school for the semester before I took this trip, it was my main source of transportation. And since I had the saddlebags, or the panniers as they call them, on the sides of the bike, I was able to load those up with groceries or books or anything else if I was going to class or needed food. And then on the weekends or free afternoons, I would hop on a bike trail or you know, a back road that wasn't too heavily trafficked and just ride 10 or 20 miles out, turn around and come back. Rode up to the Woodstock Tower a few times just to get change in elevation and everything else. In. So I did bike, I'd say, around 80 miles a week to prepare for the trip. Um, and that just included riding my bike to and from class and to work, which was you know, a 20 mile ride down Route 11 twice a week. So that, that ended up putting a little bit of mileage on, um, but there really wasn't anything serious and it definitely wasn't weighted down. So it never was very strenuous. It was just kind of getting that muscle memory and becoming comfortable on the bicycle that I was trying to go for. It never really occurred to me to add weight to the bicycle when I was training. Simply because I didn't have the means to, I was planning on, at the time when I purchased my bicycle, to use the uh, panniers, which are the saddlebags that hold all your gear that Caitlin McBride had purchased and was currently using on the trip already. I didn't buy any, so therefore I didn't have any way of attaching any serious weight to my bicycle. So I just kind of had to wait and, you know, lift weights, train by like endurance, running and stuff like that and hope it was enough. My training before the trip was very minimal. I probably biked about 80 miles and that was over the course of eight rides or so. So I, very, I had very little experience on a bike except just biking to and from class. All I learned was what I picked up on the trip, just biking day after day. I remember weighing my bike when we first headed out and I think I was right around maybe with the bicycle, my bags, and all my gear and clothes on day one, probably around, like, I want to say maybe 150 pounds, something pretty ridiculous. I think two weeks went by and I shed probably 30, 40 pounds. It was actually my first hill that went by and I shed that much weight and I was like, I don't need it. <laughs> by the time I got to Florida, I think I had just enough gear to you know, wear a set of clothes on my back, patch my bike up if I got in any jams, and carry food. Set my tent, my sleeping bag home, um, and just carried, I was very minimalistic. So definitely there was a transition over the course of the trip where I realized you know, what was necessary, what wasn't, and what I could live without. The bike, including all the gear I had on it, was about 115 pounds at one point. And then it, towards the end of the trip, as we dropped off different winter clothes and gear that we didn't need, it got down to around 80 pounds. So we never had any support vehicles or what we would call a sag wagon, supporting gear, and it sounds cool. We just relied on our three bodies to get us where we needed to go. The bike trip was completely self-supported. We carried everything that we needed. We had a tent, a sleeping bag, a little bit of camp fuel and a camp stove, some small pots and pans, and then clothes that we projected we'd need for the months ahead. And we carried all that with us on panniers or saddlebags on the side of the bikes. And I also towed behind me a one-wheel trailer it was very much self-supported. 
once I mentally committed to do the trip, you know, once I verbally committed to myself and to family and friends and told them that this is what I wanted to do, there was no backing out or turning around. I didn't even think of it as an option. I started in Virginia with my girlfriend at the time, and we biked together almost 7,000 miles going up to Maine, down around the Great Lakes, and zigzagging more or less across the northern U.S., out to Washington and down the coast of San Francisco where she left. For her and I, the learning curve was the same. We'd both never been on a bike trip before. It was all new to us, and everything we were figuring out, we were figuring out together. There wasn't one person that knew more about the, something else than another. And so we kind of learned and developed our skills on this bike trip together. So there was no lag behind or anything else. I was a bit more in better physical condition than she was. I trained a little bit more, but it's a bike trip. You have nowhere to be in all day to get there. So I wasn't too worried about the timeline. I just had her right up front. She set the pace for the day. I discussed with her you know, how far we'd like to go and how far do you think you can go, what the terrain was like and everything else. For the first two or three weeks, traveling up from Virginia all the way to Connecticut, I was lucky enough to stay with friends or family every single day. I had people that I'd known or were related to 40 to 60 miles apart and that really helped us figure out the transition into the, this touring biking world that we were so new to. From there, after Connecticut, we relied heavily on the kindness of strangers that we'd meet through a website where touring cyclists host other touring cyclists through warmshowers.org. Majority of the time, we camped. We just set up the tent, had the sleeping bags, and if we were able to build a fire and cook on that, then we would. If not, it would be a cold dinner or something like that. I was on the road for 50 weeks, 11 and a half months, and we camped maybe 200 nights, stayed with friends and family for 50 of the nights, and then relied on the overwhelming generosity of complete strangers for about 100 days. Biking in San Francisco came with plenty of hills, but none more so than most of the West Coast cities north of San Francisco. And at that point, I was very well conditioned. And ironically, I, I almost looked forward to hills because I knew when I was pedaling up one that I'd have a downhill. So it, was, it seems a little backwards, but I kind of enjoyed the, the uphills and you know, would enjoy the downhills for what they offered but knowing that I'd just have to go back up on the other side. So San Francisco, the steep short hills were nothing more than any other hill across the U.S. You just click it into a lower gear and pedal faster, move slower, and eventually you get to the top. <laughs> At the start of our trip, Ben and I flew out to meet Murdoch in San Francisco, California where we dropped our bikes off at um, some extended family's house. We started actually biking about two weeks after that. So when I first saw Murdoch, oh man, you know, the long hair, just the scraggly beard, just untouched for six months, which for some people isn't that much, but um, for what I'm used to seeing, the buzz cut, you know, shaved. I would say his body composition was definitely uh, lean, you know. I'd also say we were in the best shapes of our life just because we were doing cardio sometimes for, you know, up to like 16 hours a day. You know, the upper body is, is not as big, but your legs are like tree trunks. From San Francisco, we took Highway 1, 101, 10, south along the coast of California, which was absolutely beautiful. We headed all the way down to San Diego, at really no point in the trip did I feel that it was something unmanageable or that I'd bitten off more than I could chew. Luckily, 
for me, by the time Ben and Jackson showed up, I'd already biked seven and a half thousand miles. I'd already been on the road for six months, six and a half months. And so when they met up with me, they hadn't trained nearly as much as I had, for good reason, I guess, since I was on the trip already. When it came to the logistics of the trip, Murdoch had it all planned out. He's been doing this for six months. He rode his bike to California, and now we're doing a five-month leg back. I figured there would be a learning curve, physically, mentally, and everything else with Jackson and Ben. Our first day was somewhat flat, but rolling hill day. And then day two came, and that's where the fun began, because we had to ride over this six mile mountain, which wasn't the only part of the day. And then we had another 40 miles after that, which made me really second guess coming on this trip. For me, the hardest part of the trip was day two. And day two, we took a hill. Um, it was about a six mile hill. And, you know, I was overloaded with extra gear and clothes that I didn't know I didn't need. It took about three hours. I've rode hills before, but I never rode them weighted down. So it was my first real challenge. We rode a 40 mile day for their first day, and then another 40 mile day that took us up 1,000 to 1,500 foot climb up and over from San Jose to Santa Cruz, California. By the end of it, they were pushing their bikes and walking up the hills. They needed a rest day on day three. The 40 mile days, I had done days that were four times that long. 40 mile days is what I started with when I started in Virginia with Caitlin. I felt that they were very reasonable days. There was one big hill that was a couple miles long and it really seemed to catch up to Jackson and Ben quick. It wasn't anything out of the ordinary. And so I was a little frustrated with them not being able to keep up. But at the same time, I understood there was no place that we had to be. We didn't have a deadline to come back to in Virginia. There was no real rush on things. It was just that I was able to do a heck of a lot more miles in the beginning than they were. Going through day two, having such a difficult day, I, looked, I relied on my ability not to quit and just fight through, not let one bad day make me not want to complete something I started. Climbing that hill on the second day, I, there was definitely pressures there, yeah. There was, a lot of it was self-inflicted, right? You know, so I have this idea of what my work ethic is and I have this idea of like what I can accomplish or what I think I can and so I'm pushing myself, you know, I'm pushing myself real hard. I'm, I'm trying to go higher and faster and farther. But part of the pressure was, you know, there's I'm in a group of people and you know, I'm trying to do I'm trying to do better than other people. I'm 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 competitive, but it, I like to think of it as like a healthy you know, relationship with myself and my peers, but um, yeah, I didn't want to be the one that was dragging the most, um, but you know, I wanted to be there for the one who was. I never did I think, you know, I should turn around, I should go back, like never did I second guess myself. Um, part of the reason I took on the trip was to define my boundaries, determine what my limits are, you know, push myself and see what, I, what can I accomplish. And I surely wasn't going to give up on the second day. Maybe it's okay that we're not going as far as I'm used to or that we're taking a little more rest days than everything else. We also had different styles of how we got stuff done. We just ran on different operating systems, all three of us. It was almost a daily occurrence that there would be a little conniption thrown by the one of the three of us. But sometimes you just have to ignore it and just focus on the road. They weren't completely compatible. Some things never worked out. 
and you just learn to accept it. But yeah, it, it got easier as it went along. It certainly did. In the beginning, it was we butted heads more so than not. I think Murdoch said this best when he said sometimes the hardest or most challenging part of our day was finding a place to rest our heads at night. And that was definitely true. Um, if it wasn't for the friends and family, you know, that were all over the place for us, uh, to complete random strangers, it would have been a very, very difficult trip. Most commonly, um, our day started off with planning out our route around this app called Warm Showers. And we would use this mobile application on our cell phones to look up, you know, random strangers' houses that would host us just because we were riding a bicycle to their house and really for no more reason than that. At first, I was very surprised when people would open their homes to us, almost a little paranoid. You know, you'd come to a random stranger's house, they would greet you with open arms and for no reason other than, you know, I showed up on a bicycle. Like, I, I'm telling you about this extravagant journey I'm undertaking, um, but really, like, I just showed up to your house on a bicycle, you know? So, who really am I? You don't know. Like, I don't really know you that well. And it was just a little kind of scary at first. And, but as time went on, you know, you learn to accept kindness. And that was a definite challenge for me, which is being able to accept generosity and you know, a lot of times I didn't have much on me and I couldn't really give stuff back, you know, like they were given to me. So it definitely humbled, humbled me in the process of the trip, you know, just accepting so much random acts of kindness. Through the online website and people just stopping and saying, would you like to stay with us for the night after seeing our bags and traveling, I stayed with about 90 to 100 complete strangers that I'd never met before in my life. All of them were unbelievably fantastic. They were great, more than generous, open, welcoming, and warm. There was a few that were a little different. They weren't bad, they were just different, but everybody's a little different, I guess. And every place we stayed with, I kept a little running journal of their names, an address, everything else, so I could send them thank you cards when I got done with the trip. We then stayed with people that weren't around and said, you're more than welcome to camp in our yard. Had a little herb garden, said, you help yourself to whatever you can find. You know, the peppers and the tomatoes are in, so if they're ripe, they're all yours. There's some spices over here. Sorry, we can't meet you. We even stayed with one person in Wisconsin and I called him up and asked if we could stay the following day. And he says, well, let me ask my wife. You hear him mumble. And he says, yeah, that's more than fine if you stay there. Are you trustworthy? <laughs> I was a little caught off guard, but said not to toot my own horn or anything. But yes, sir, I think I am pretty trustworthy. And he goes, okay, good. Well, our garage code is this. My wife and I are in Alaska for three weeks. So we're not around, but help yourself to anything you can find. The towels are downstairs. There's a bedroom here. You're more than welcome to do laundry. And then he even went on to apologize that he didn't have food in the fridge because it was a five week vacation and he was still gone for another three weeks. I said, don't apologize. It's like, this is, you're being more than generous. I mean, the, so the warmth and support that we found, even through people we didn't know, was unparalleled. I mean, it was really a, fantastic experience and it's the reason why for me the people were the best part about this trip without question some days we didn't know where we were gonna sleep the next night so we would just ride as far as we wanted and just stop along the road and camp camping wasn't too difficult to find places we ran into a few difficulties where it was getting late and there was no campsites around. In the first half of the trip, we ended up staying at known campsites a little bit more so we could better plan out ahead of time how far we were gonna go, where we were gonna get to. From there, it was a little bit easier to find campsites. But on the second half of the trip, the funds weren't 
nearly as there as they were in the first part of the trip. So instead of paying for campsites, we would take advantage of just stealth camping or sneak camping and be riding along and then, you know, around dusk or late afternoon, sometimes even well into the night, if we found a grove of trees that we could go camp beside or we were in the desert, we would just stop and go a couple hundred feet off the road and set up camp out of sight, out of mind. The one night particularly was pretty stressful and difficult. You know, we stopped a little early and we went and knocked on a couple doors. But after about three failed attempts to even meet someone at the door, we finally got a response. And it was, uh, it was one I'll never forget. This old man approached the door and he's staring at us through the glass, like, and he just starts yelling at us. Get off my lawn, like, you need to, you need to get out of here right now. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna call the cops, I'm calling the cops right now. And like, the amount of fear that he showed us in his face, and like his eyes, at first it was frustrating, you know, cause it was like, you know, you don't even know us. We're decent people. We felt bad that he felt so much fear um, that he couldn't even, you know, open up or consult some, some people. Um, that was something we kind of just moved on from because it was getting dark, you know. Uh, some of the other neighbors that saw us knocking on their doors, or, or doors earlier approached us later in, in their car and we always phrase it so it's not like uh, we're not trying to corner anyone. So we're like, do you all know of any place like around the area where we can set up a camp? You know, kind of hinting at the fact that, you know, their yard is <laughs> A pretty pretty optimal spot but if there's a campsite nearby and they don't feel comfortable with us in their yard then they'll you know they'll suggest that instead so there's a way out but this particular night there was no way out and there was no option so we continued biking down the road saw a trailer park we were just gonna pedal to the end of the road and throw a tent up behind some trailers um, there ended up being a bear problem so we continued trekking by this point, I believe it was around 12 o'clock, we pedaled for maybe another four hours before we found a motel and just called it quits, you know, hung up for the night. But it was one of the longer nights, um, longer days of biking. I can't recall there being too many instances where I think of traffic being a huge issue. We rode on all kinds of roads, and we had roads that were, well, the interstate, where it's legal to ride. We rode on back roads where there was no traffic and even pushed our bike through a swamp at one point. We certainly ran into our fair share of cities, nearly all of them around the perimeter of the country. Even when it was crowded or rush hour, or there was a lot of people on the road, never seemed to have anybody that was out to get us or would you know, ride close to us on purpose. Some people were more comfortable riding with bikes, and so they, they might just be closer than us, or there was two cars passing. Um, we've ridden on roads that were 60 mile an hour roads with no shoulders. Seems a little crazy in hindsight, but there was no other way to go. Stick to the very right side of the lane. I'd stare 30 or 40 feet ahead of me right at the white line and I would just ride on the white line for as much as they'd let me. I mean, there was definitely a time in California riding on Highway 10 on the coastline where I was run off the road by a big logging truck. Maybe two days before that where a minivan came so close it was like, like my elbow could have touched their mirror. There's certainly incidences where I could have stuck out my elbow or, or arm and had it taken off by a car. And stuff like that kind of happens um, when you're on the coast of California more often, I would say, because it's just so scenic. Everyone's looking at the beautiful views and the coastline and the cliff sides rather than the people on the road. I was more than comfortable riding. So you just become really comfortable on the road. Um, you're uneasy at first, but you become real comfortable with the space you're given. I can recall a few instances where I took a nap on the side of a highway coming out of California with tractor trailers going by less than five feet away. Pretty much 
every time we stopped, I would get away with taking a short nap. I mean, I would fall asleep everywhere, side of the road, you know, sitting up in a chair at an ice cream shake in my hand, like, just because I was exhausted. That being said, that meant that someone else was in charge of calling the end of the break. Sometimes we ended up crashing at places, you know, for hours. There's only so much you can do to kind of combat the elements. You're out there long enough riding eight or 10 hours a day and it's raining those eight or 10 hours, you're gonna get wet. <laughs> For the weather, we had rain gear, we had extra layers, because that's the best thing to do for the cold. When it got really hot, I would just make sure that I wore long sleeves so that the sun wasn't getting to me, and then you drink plenty of water. There's plenty of times that we'd look at the weather and it would be too harsh, or it was calling for a lot of rain, torrential winds. I'd talk to Caitlin or talk to Jackson and Ben and say, here's what tomorrow's forecast is. Maybe it's supposed to rain on Wednesday, but Thursday and Friday are fine. So instead of taking a rest day on Friday, why don't we just take that rest day here on Wednesday? Food was the fuel that got us around. It was always priority number one. And we'd always have breakfast and lunch items with us, but if we ran out of peanut butter or jelly or yogurt or granola bars or this, that, and the other, we'd make sure that we went and stopped and picked some up at our next available opportunity just to have it with us because food was as important, if not the most important thing on the trip. Spending six, eight, the most I ever spent was 17 hours on, on a bike in one day. To do that much cardio every day, my body was just burning fuel constantly, whether it was in my sleep or not. I could feel it. I was full on the trip twice. There was two days in particular of the entire year that I'd reached my limit with food. And even then, you know, I'd be stuffed, couldn't move. 30 minutes later, I'd, I'd be hungry again. So the amount of calories we consumed on a daily basis, the amount of protein we ate was pretty much ridiculous. I would say maybe fourfold of what I'm consuming now. Our schedule was dictated by food. We'd only get five or 10 miles before we, we stopped and had a snack. But we'd basically just not stop eating the entire day. Meals ranged from like four to seven meals a day, various sizes, but we just wouldn't stop eating. And then once we were on the road, we would eat every 15 to 20 miles normally. We would just get hungry. It would be a nice little rest for our legs. We usually had four, five, or six meals a day, and sometimes they were just snacks, and then sometimes they were full dinners we sat down to. Throughout the day, we estimated we ate about 4,000 calories. I averaged, I would think, ballpark, about three and a half to 4,000 calories a day. And then on some of my longer days, I'd counted just because I was curious. I'd eaten up to six or seven and a half thousand calories. But I never really actually counted calories except for one time. The day I counted calories was uh, the day I left from Charlotte, North Carolina to Greensboro to Blacksburg. And I planned on biking it nonstop. I ended up consuming just under 11,000 calories and just over 260 grams of protein that day, a 219 mile day. It didn't matter if it was perishable or not perishable. It wouldn't last long enough to spoil. So we ended up being able to carry refrigerated items for the most part. Our go-to for food was without question peanut butter. Middle of the day, a staple was peanut butter and jelly. Like way more peanut butter than one should ever eat multiple times a day. If I had to guess, I was on pace for the first half of the trip to eat my body weight in peanut butter. And so I still think I probably ate somewhere between 150 and 180 pounds of peanut butter last year. <laughs> as far as food goes, you just tried to put good in because put good in, you get good out.
Keeping our electronic devices and most importantly our phone charged was simpler than I thought it would be. And a lot of people were curious as to how we did it. We had a portable charger for the second half of the trip. We would keep our phones and other electronic devices charged either with our portable external batteries. On the way out, Caitlin's bike had a generator hub in the front of her bike and you could go ahead and just plug in any USB port, hook it up to your phone and keep it charged while, while she rode, generating electricity. That broke halfway out, but even then we were still able to stop at a grocery store or a gas station or go into a little cafe and grab some tea or bite to eat, plug in our phones into the wall and get juice that way if we needed to. Or for the most part, we would just find an outlet somewhere and charge it up either overnight or at a grocery store or just at someone's house we were staying with. I was able to have phone service most of the way around the country. Many areas didn't have service on this trip, especially out west in the mountains and also in the southeast, such as northern Georgia and Tennessee. But I was able to get service around well enough to pull up the map if need be. We also had paper maps. We would be biking, having our GPS telling us where to go, and having our maps pulled out on our phone. And then we would just lose service. So luckily we could operate sometimes with our phones not having service, but other times we would just have to ask directions or use our paper maps. We were able to figure it out most places. I think the longest I went without phone service was five days or a week in South Dakota, Nebraska. But even then, we were just camping most of the night so we didn't need to call anybody. When we would lose service to our phones, we would just take it as another challenge we would usually have a general idea of where we wanted to go and that wouldn't change, but we would just continue on our route. If we ran into directional problems, we would take our best guess or we'd ask someone else who knew the area. Life existed well before phones, so we, we figured it out pretty quick. I was very fortunate in the fact that I didn't get injured by accidents, and I also didn't find myself having any kind of physical ailments. But the same can't be said for everybody else on the trip. As far as injuries go, that I think I was the only one that took a few spills. Jackson fell off twice, but that was just because, actually he fell off about every day. He just would be on his phone, or I'm not sure, he just wasn't paying attention and would just go off the curb and then have to get back on, but nobody got hurt. It started raining, I think we were in Mississippi, and we were probably five miles from our destination, and, and you know, it was just pouring on us, but we just kept going through it anyway. And I think the oils from the road kind of started to wash off, and you know that little white line on the you know edge of the road that kind of separates the rumble strip from the actual road? Well, I hit that with my bike tire, and my bike just went out from underneath me. I was okay, ended up breaking my front brake, which I just decided I wasn't going to use for the next month because I didn't want to repair it. Besides that, I took a spill on a set of train tracks. Caitlin, and she held up great. She did more than great. But there was a few times where her knee would sort of bother her. So she got a knee brace. And after a week or so of riding through it, helped itself, healed itself kind of thing. Then the other one would pain her a little bit. She had a little lower back or neck issues just from being hunched over all day. But it was just, from it came from riding in a position that you don't really get into on a normal day-to-day -day basis. At the beginning of the trip, I had a lot of pain in my calves. And as we moved on across the southern tier, my calves got used to it, but then Somewhere in Texas, my knees started giving me trouble. So that was 
another obstacle to overcome that was really painful, but I just had to grit through it and tough it out. I did incur an injury somewhere in California um, just because we were biking, you know, loaded down for the first time. And I think it kind of hit my right knee a little bit. But honestly, I didn't do anything differently um, except take a couple aspirin in the morning for about a period of three days and kind of went away. You engineered your body, you know, you fed it protein, you, you know, so much, so much vitamins, so much minerals. It's like you'd recover pretty quickly from some small stuff. I think Ben had some, some injuries or something. One particular day, we got lost uh, coming out of New Orleans, headed into Mississippi Carrier, actually. We were headed up the highway or on a road parallel to it. The way that Google Maps routed us ended up taking us this crazy path through a swamp. This was a day that I was leading, and at first it starts off with a locked gate with a path around it, and then that path turns into gravel to a dirt road and from a dirt road to grass that really hasn't been cut but it's too thick to ride through and the next thing you know you're coming into places that you literally can't cross unless you dig out that six by six submerged wooden beam that had fallen from the hundred year old bridge that fell you dig that beam up and you make a little path and that means it's only uh, two, a bridge that's two foot off the ground, but it's something that is maybe, you know, 40 feet wide and you're not trying to trudge through all that water. And so you dig out a big metal grate and you make yourself an uh, impromptu bridge and you walk across it and maybe someone steps on a rusty nail and it goes through their right shoe and it really hurts. Or maybe someone's left foot breaks through a board and, you know, they scrape up their knee and they get their foot submerged in water. but you keep going anyway and at this point we were on like what seemed to be the edge of a levee and then we crossed over a dam and we could see some sort of structure in the distance and we came up to our next locked gate and by this time I was really thinking that Google Maps has led us astray and I see some people on the other side of the locked gate so I just hop it real quick and, and they're all wearing hard hats and jeans and stuff and I walk up and I'm like I bet y'all don't get too many visitors around here. And they all just like stop and turn around at, and look at me like, what did you say? And like one guy gets up and is like, you're not supposed to be here. And I'm like, yeah, why is that? He's like, you're on a military base. I'm like, oh no. He's like, oh yeah. He's like, walk with me. And he kind of like, took me out under his like arm a little bit and like showed like showed me over to the gate where I came from and we got over to the gate he's like you see that over there to your right I'm like I'm like yeah what is that he's like he's like that's a launch pad they launch rockets from there it's like you're in a military base right now he's like how'd you even get here I'm like I don't know but how do I get out he's like I was like I was like Google Maps just dre honestly led me right to this point. I'm like, can I just take that road? Because that's where it's telling me. He's like, if you take that road, you're going to be spending the night in jail. I'm like, well, we don't really know where to spend the night. And, you know, it's a free meal. And like, But we are kind of just like, you know, just going back and forth at it. But he's like, no, you can't do that. And so we turned around, and he's like, the best thing you can do is go back in the way you came. You know, look out for the hogs and gators because, you know, the swamp you came through, there, there are hogs and gators. And we we're just a little paranoid on the way back, like hoping we didn't see people like guards coming. We hustled on the way out. After we did that, Google Maps popped up a second route and it's like, oh, you're trying to go to Carrier? Like here's, a, here's an alternative route, which it didn't show us earlier. And so I was like a little like, all right, whatever. So we followed that route and that just brought us up to another guard station and they're like, oh, you can't go through here unless you have a government issued ID. Like, you work for the state or you're a military veteran or something like that. It was just, we turned around and we went back to the highway, called the, you know, state department and tried to figure out directions, if we could ride on the highway or not, and we couldn't.
we had a few encounters with black bears that would digging at trash or garbage in the middle of the road in front of us, mainly in Connecticut. And so we had to stop and wait for 10 or 15 minutes while they did their thing. And then once a car came up, it kind of scared them off. And so we just rode past real quick. I think the worst encounter was um, probably with just raccoons, you know, digging into your food bag and stuff like that. When we were camping, I only had a few encounters of raccoons getting into our stuff in the middle of the night. And they would steal a pastry we had or one ate the entire loaf of bread. To keep our food safe, we would take some preventative measures. And so we'd tie up our food, throw it over a tree and pull it up and hang it in bear bags or anything like that. But as a general rule, we just kept it on the bike and it really didn't cause too much harm or get any wildlife to come too close to us. I don't think anything ever chased us. We definitely ran into alligators, which we found awesome. Georgia particularly, there was lots of snakes along the road. Some were dead, some weren't. Every once in a while you'll, you'll be riding on the road and your feet are clipped into the pedals of course because you got the shoes that do that. Um, so you can't really like take your feet off real quick but you'll be riding down the road and you'll see a snake just right underneath your pedals and you'll want to like rip your feet up off the ground because you're, you're reacting to it but you can't and that's always like a heart fluttering moment but besides some snakes and some alligators that's about it. I, I could be a part-time bicycle mechanic I'm pretty sure. I don't know all the ins and outs, and I certainly don't have all the tools, nor am I super efficient with some of the specialty parts of being a bike mechanic, but as far as run-of-the-mill maintenance is concerned, I have no problem taking apart and putting together 90% of that bike. We had a chain tool, so I could take apart and put on a new chain, or if the chain breaks, you can take out that broken link, retie it together and make it shorter. I had stretched the chain out on my bike because, you know, it's metal, but it's still a little bit ductile. And I just it rode it until that stretched out five times. So I'm on my sixth chain right now. You carry spare spokes on you. So if you break a spoke in the bike, then you can take it out, and put a new one in. We would carry tubes with us or patch kits normally because they're just a heck of a lot cheaper. If our tire was getting low and we knew that we were going into the middle of western Texas or northern South Dakota, then we would plan accordingly and maybe pick up a spare tire. But tubes, you know, I lost count past 50, so 60, I don't know. And patch, patches, maybe 100 patches. I went through about 100 tubes, I would have to guess. I, I lost count somewhere. And then the tires themselves, the hard rubber on the outside, I wore those down till they were slick or had run holes in them for 12 of those, six sets of those tires. We probably went through a collective dozen tires altogether. And so we got really efficient at being able to take off an inner tube, patch it up, reseal it, put it back on the bike and pump it up. I got it down to, you know, five or 10 minutes at my best, but in the beginning it would take 45 minutes to an hour sometimes, you know, so we could fix everything for the most part that happened on a minor scale. And for the major stuff, we'd have preventative maintenance, go into the bike shop and ask them to check it out, give us a once over, tune it up, see if there's any problems. But other than that, it was just take it in stride as it comes. If a major thing happened, then we would limp or push our bikes at one point or just ride with that defect until we could get to the nearest bike shop. Coming up the East Coast, started getting back into areas of the world where I had friends and family and familiar faces that I'd seen before. It was nice. I met some wonderful people that I'd complete strangers on the trip, but you can't fake the time and the history of aunts and uncles that I've grown up with or cousins or friends that I've known for 
nothing to take away from these strangers, but that I've known for more than three hours or six hours. Ben and I crossed into Virginia, right at the Bristol, Tennessee border. It was nostalgic, really. Familiar terrain. You're used to the types of trees, the layout of the land. You know, you're running into mountains that we're familiar with. And by the time I got up to Blacksburg, Virginia, and that's where I went to school, it was home. You know, once I was north of there, I started passing places that I played soccer at growing up. About a month before we arrived, I told my mom she wanted to date as to my expected arrival time, and which was tough to do since I was only traveling 10 miles an hour, but I told her I expect to show up on May 9th. And so she ended up talking to a lot of the people in the local paper, her connection with Boy Scouts, and it just being a smaller town in general. We were able to get a dozen Boy Scouts that met up with me a mile or two outside of town and they all had their bikes and then family and friends just a little bit of everybody showed up and we had I don't know 30 to 50 people on bicycles waiting for me and Ben and Jackson and we were led by the sheriff's department and even had the Woodstock fire department come out and they had a truck that followed us all the way in so it was it was nothing short of a spectacle coming in, a small parade, if you will, coming into town. Homecoming was magnificent. Um, I was ready for it. For me, the period of five months was perfect. Coming home, it was nice. I was grateful I did the trip, but I wanted it to be a nice big trip, not a lifestyle. And after 12 months, it's not even in the gray area anymore. It starts to be a lifestyle. So it was, it was nice to kind of wrap up the trip and finish it up with it. The five months for me capped off with ending in Woodstock, Virginia was more than I could have asked for. There was friends and family and uh, it, was, it was the highlight of the trip, you know, one of many, but I was just so ready for it. I don't know if I could do, you know, 10, 11 months on the road like Murdoch did. Just mentally, you know, physically, that's just such a drain. I didn't anticipate the trip taking as long as it did. Twelve months was a bit longer than I thought it would take. Originally, I had planned for eight or nine months, but with the month overlap of when Caitlin left and Jackson and Ben flew in to San Francisco, that bumped up my nine months to about ten. And then between the off days and riding at a a pace that was different than what I thought it would be. It just added on another month or two to the trip. If I were riding by myself, then I think it still probably would have taken eight or nine months. But I would have, I wouldn't have had nearly as many or been able to collect as much opportunity and experiences as I was had I had slowed down and spent a little more time. I didn't go into the trip with many expectations. I planned and figured out the routes and had an idea of what it would have in store for me. That ended up not really scratching the surface on the experiences that I gained out of it and the stuff that I learned about myself. The most important thing I came away with was a better understanding of who I was. If I were to do it over again, I would make sure I was more prepared for the California mountains and the train there because starting from scratch and not having any biking fitness to riding mountains every day was definitely a challenge. The only thing more active than your legs is your mind and when you're on that bike for you know, it was upward of um, you know 12, 16 hours on some, some of the longer days you spend a lot of time thinking. So you really do get to know yourself. Um, you know, you entertain yourself and you kind of soul search and kind of figure out who you are, like what, what do you want in life? I've ran into people that do the trip and within the first two weeks quit. I've ran into people 
that'll do the trip fall so in love or so infatuated with it that they spend their next couple of months working till they can save up enough to do another short trip, do that trip, and just spend a lifestyle of working to bike and biking to work. And then I've met people that will do the trip, throw their bike off a tallest building or a cliff they can find, never touch it again. And I'm somewhere in the middle. I'm very grateful that I was had this opportunity and that I was able to complete it and safely. But there was there's nothing drawing me away from it. And there's nothing that's actively pushing me towards it. So it was something I set out to do. I accomplished it and if there was any part of it that would really pull me back into the biking world, I, it would be the, the people and the experiences I met through them. I was actually thinking about the other day, I think my next adventure, which is definitely going to be a next adventure, is going to be, you know, possibly canoeing the entire Shenandoah River. I think that would just be awesome. Or maybe hiking the entire Appalachian Trail. Um, you know, the idea of ice climbing and you know, summoning large mountains, or rock climbing, have it really excites me. Um, I'm outdoorsy, I love to camp and stuff like that, so I know there's going to be something, I just don't know what. I feel like I've accomplished this and I don't need anything else to prove with it, biking wise. If the opportunity brought itself up again, a shorter tour seems very feasible. I wouldn't mind, I wouldn't have any trouble doing that. Maybe if it's for a week, half a week or two weeks or something of that nature and spend it doing the tour somewhere in a part of the world or country that I've never been. But when people ask if I'd ever do this trip again, it'd be another 12 months that I would commit. <laughs> so that's a fairly large chunk of time just to picture myself doing again on a bike trip. I, I, I think in the end, I definitely surprised myself um, with you know, where I started out, where I ended up, you know, being like different job industries, what kind of job I was trying to pursue, and like what kind of self-sacrifice that would take from me, you know, what kind of lifestyle changes that would mean, um, and how the bike trip affected me getting there, you know, just having that time to think about it. My next task, my next big goal is to become gainfully employed. I already have a job lined up for me down in Richmond, Virginia, and so that'll be my next big adventure. <laughs> Becoming financially and everything else independent and stable.